Okay, Senator Reed of Rhode Island is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Paul, for being here today. Uh, we saw in the wake of COVID the globalized supply chain disrupted significantly, and we're in the process of, in some respects of rebuilding a supply chain with emphasis on sourcing in the United States. To what extent did that disruptive supply chain contribute to inflation, and to what extent will the new, if you envision it, the new supply chain that is located in the United States and other friendly countries uh, affect inflation? So the, the initial outbreak of inflation was all about uh, spending on goods where people couldn't spend on services. So good spending went way up, and the, the global supply chain, many, many goods are imported. The global supply chain just collapsed, and that was the source of the original inflation. It has now spread over the last two years to housing and also to the rest of the service sector. So to your question, we are seeing goods prices, goods inflation has been coming down for some time now, it's still too high, but it's coming down. Housing services uh, is, is there's in the pipeline. You see the new leases that are being signed, and what that tells you is that in the next six to twelve months, we will see that come down. But this this big service sector that's everything else, which is financial services, medical services, travel and leisure, uh, all of those things. That's really where this, that's the source of the inflation we have now, which had nothing to do with the supply, or not much to do with the supply chains. That's where, that's where the challenge is now. And is there anything that you can do that would target th that service area without affecting the other areas? There's not really. You know, we are, the, our uh, monetary policy tools are, are famously powerful but blunt. Uh, a different topic, and that is, as you're probably aware, the Fifth Circuit uh, delivered a ruling in the Community Financial Services Association versus CFPB that the CFPB's funding mechanism is unconstitutional. Uh, just like the Board of Governors, the CFPB is a bureau of the Federal Reserve. Both the Board of Governors and the CFPB rely on the same source of funds and draw on those funds in virtually identical ways. If the Board of governors' funding structure will be found unconstitutional. What would the implications be for the country and monetary policy? Well, they, it would be very significant, but I, I have to say I am, we have significant responsibilities, but I would uh, be reluctant to comment on a case that's before the Supreme Court. Uh, but it is, a, it is certainly something that you've had people examine for possible ramifications. Yes, and you know, the central banks tend to be self-funding because of the way, that, the way they work, and that's a key factor of our independence. Uh, we've gone back and forth on the impact of uh, rate heights on, on workers, and uh, you've indicated previously that wages uh, have not been spiraling upwards necessarily, and that inflation expectations are currently stable. Uh, but uh, the impact on increased interest rates are usually felt more by low to moderate income people. Uh, is there any way you can work yourself out of that dilemma? <laughs> <laughs> um, so where, where we are right now, of course, is very low unemployment. Uh, wages have been moderating, mm -hmm. and they've been doing so without uh, a softening in the labor market, without a rising unemployment, really. And that's a good thing. So. Um, we, we really don't know. This, the current situation is a combination of more typical supply and demand issues, but also just things that we haven't seen before, like, like the war in, in Ukraine, like the, you know, like the supply chains that you mentioned. Right. So uh, we have many unusual factors, and I, I don't think anybody knows with confidence how this is going to play out. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.